we're ready to get started, hopefully you guys remember that my name is Martha and I head up the product marketing team at LogPoint. So welcome to today's session. We'll be joined by Niels and he's super good at this stuff and is our like go-to demo person, so you're really in for a treat. This part one of the session will be more of an introduction. Niels will go into this and then part two will be more of the hands-on. So with that quick little intro, take it away, Niels. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, as Martha said, my name is Neil Crumery. I'm a senior pre-sales engineer in Lockpoint. Um, I've been with Lockpoint for about four years, which in Lockpoint terms is a long time. Um, otherwise, not so much. Um, and just to clarify what you can expect in this session, uh, because it might be quite different to what came before, uh, this is a relatively deep dive. Um, and I see a lot of faces in here, so I need to kind of judge the room a little bit uh, beforehand so I know which way we're going. Um, there are multiple ways we can kind of go deep in this. Um, so how many of you are actively using Lockpoint at the moment? Wow, okay, cool. And I assume you're all relatively happy with searches and so on. Okay, um, so in that sense then I might not be going deep enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, I will, uh, in the first part of this session, I will be showing you some um, uh, queries that I have seen used and that are useful, maybe a few ticks, trips, uh, tick, tricks and tips um, that you might not be aware of. Um, uh, and there are two use cases that we've um, recently come across where we build specific searches that highlight quite well um, you know, how you might build up a more complicated search query. Uh, but that's essentially the, the level we're at with this. Um, so if you're not happy with search queries or you're expecting me to know um, an awful lot that um, you very specifically need, uh, then that might not be the right place. Obviously, at any point, please feel free to you know, uh, point something out, mistakes that I make, uh, ideas that you have on the search queries and so on. Um, I've also decided to sit down here um, for the next two hours because I'm not just presenting um, like a slide deck that you kind of just take in. Um, that's the first part of this two hour course, shall we say. Um, and the idea was that we would do exercises, uh, but especially with searches, I thought running searches on your laptops uh, might be a bit boring. Uh, so in the second half, if you do decide to stay around, uh, we'll be running a capture the flag exercise against a lock point that you will have access to. Um, for that, you will need your laptop. Uh, and it's the first time we've done it in kind of this uh, environment, uh, but my colleagues in Nepal built this and they've run it with universities um, twice now. Um, so they all scored very highly, uh, so I hope you will too. Um, it is a bit of fun. There will be a pile of hoodies to kind of get at the end of it. Um, but um, yeah, don't take it too seriously. We're still learning on Capture the Flags as well. Um, but hopefully that's something for those of you that kind of, ah, I can do all the queries. Um, then you can doze off now and you join us um, for the second half and hopefully that, that will get you interested. Um, that's the introduction. Uh, I've run this course before um, online, I think twice we did, uh, and we are probably going to run it again. Um, I'm trying to evolve it over time, but it is fairly similar to what we've run last year. So if you have seen this in a different forum, then again, it will probably be uh, repeating. Uh, it is part of our increasing course curriculum that we have. So if you've seen outside the kind of training booth and the different courses we offer, there's obviously the proper Lockpoint user training and admin training that I assume most of you will have been on in one form or another uh, and we have a few more advanced courses that are free that we're trying to repeat from time to time that people can get into. So in terms of what we'll be covering, um, the first part might be for those people that ended up in here and that don't lo know lock point searches. Seeing the show of hands, I'll probably rush through that a bit more. Uh, and then there's four areas that come up um, or three areas that come up in multiple ways. Uh, the first one is field manipulation. Uh, so what do I do with fields uh, once I get them back? Um, there might be reasons why I want to manipulate them. There's a lot of cool stuff in Lockpoint that you know, is a bit obscure, so um, that's something that I was going to share. Uh, the second is a relatively short one, but a nifty one. Um, how do you get data out of Lockpoint? Uh, and then time is the bane of our lives when you run searches and so on. That's sometimes quite tricky. So there's a few things that I can share there. Uh, and then as I said, lastly, there's two use cases at the end where we essentially build queries 
um, uh, for um, implementations, and I think one was a support ticket or something like that. Uh, and they, they're using nifty tricks in the queries. And then, as I said, that'll be the second part, um, relatively straightforward, capture the flag <laughs> uh, at three. Um, we'll get you set up beforehand, and we'll see how much time we have left. Okay, just a um, quick uh, repetition of searches in Lockpoint. Um, there is the Lockpoint um, structure to the language, um, and there is, um, we call it the filter, which is essentially the search, and then these um, uh, div dividers to kind of run further um, process commands or aggregations. Um, so I assume that's kind of familiar to people. Um, I won't go into too much detail. Um, there's always the raw log, um, there's always the index log, uh, and then there's also the labels that we apply to messages. Um, we try to be consistent both with our taxonomy as well as with the labels. Um, that doesn't always work, so it's always worth having a look at what the labels are that we do apply, um, but um, that's something that we will be using later as well. Um, for um, anyone using Lockpoint, the key um, thing to look out for is the norm ID field. Um, so if there is a norm ID, it means that the Lockpoint normalizer has understood the message. Um, so that's always worth doing, um, running a search for minus norm ID equals star, which means that would bring back all the messages that have not been normalized. Um, and it's always, um, you know, everyone tries to get everything normalized, but uh, if you have a lot of data, there's tends to be a handful of messages maybe slipping through that aren't normalized, that's probably normal. Um, it kind of depends on the nature of the, the data that you're ingesting. Uh, I recently had a, a, a Unix a Linux system um, where, where we have a lot of normalizers and they sometimes generate messages in Syslog that are just um, almost clear text. So it's just worth sometimes checking that to make sure that there's nothing left in there that's super important. Uh, but if it is messages that are pretty useless, then there's no real need to normalize them either. Um, this is something that um, most people are aware of, but it can actually be really useful. Um, behind the fields, there's this little um, down arrow that you can um, select to drop down further options. Uh, and there are obviously useful things in there like who is a DNS. Um, if you do have recorded future, uh, you can kind of look that up directly from there. Um, it depends on the type of field, and that's something that's not immediately obvious, but Lockpoint does know different field types. So if it is an IP address, Lockpoint knows it's an IP address, and it can offer you the who is and the DNS for it. If you did that on you know, a, a, a string field, uh, you wouldn't get that option. Um, the other thing you can do from there is add that to the interesting fields. So in the left-hand side, where it automatically builds the results, um, you can add that to that area the next time you run the search. Um, and um, that's easier than having to kind of go in and select that um, field manually or something. Um, you can just do it from there. Uh, and then lastly, that's something that came in, I think, in 6.12 or so. If you do have a search template that uses that field, you can jump directly into that search template from there. Uh, and it populates the search template with that field. That's not something that's immediately obvious either, but it can be use useful if you have a search template, for example, that uses the user information um, to bring back all the file access for that field. If you find a username in here, you can click that down arrow, explore in um, file access search template, uh, and it gives you the information for that field that you've selected. Um, we do that a lot in the demo system, um, but because we don't have that many pre-built search templates, it's something that most people don't uh, actually realize, and it's, it's useful so you don't always have to manipulate your query, you can kind of do it that way. Um, as an example, if you have a widget um, that has information on there, uh, you can click on individual items in that widget, uh, it pops up those various options. I have to be honest, I usually just go to view logs, uh, I don't know whether that's something that you find. Um, I don't often do those drill downs. I probably do that from the search query. Uh, and then obviously what you get back um, is um, you know, uh, the search results and also it builds that search query for you. Um, again, often that works fine. If you have complicated search queries and you start clicking a lot in the GUI, then it might add certain things that contradict or kind of get repeated and so on in the query. So at that point, you're kind of writing the query yourself. Um, so the things that are in that search, um, as any good search should be, is key value pairs. 
Um, so um, if you're doing full text searches, that obviously works. And, and it's surprising how many badly written queries we see in support. Uh, that's not anyone's fault, but it kind of comes with practice that um, if you can avoid full text searches, um, the uh, key value pairs here are firstly the user. That was the bit that we clicked on on the previous widget. Uh, so it added that to us. Um, it's often worth adding the norm ID to your query, especially when you're doing something like an alert rule or a, a dashboard. Um, because again, we often see people accidentally or forgetfulness um, forget to limit the repo they're searching against. So by putting that norm ID in the search, it really quickly can discard all the locks that don't matter. Um, uh, so for performance reasons and so on, it's always worth not se searching more than you need to. So if it's a query against Windows logs, it's worth having norm ID in there. Uh, most of our dashboards and alert rules are built like that if you need an example, um, but it's just good practice. Um, and then we're using, um, I've talked about the norm ID. Um, this is what happened um, through the clicking. In this case, it doesn't matter, but obviously I clicked on user log point, so it added that at the beginning. Uh, and then there's this user at the end that was already in the query. Uh, so obviously this is more specific, so it still works, but um, clicking on stuff can sometimes um, mess things up. Um, and then obviously we're using those labels. Um, and especially these Windows labels, time and time again, we use in searches and alerts. Uh, label user, label account, label management, label delete. That kind of gives you an idea of what it is that we're actually looking for. And it's easier for some people uh, than searching for event ID 4726, whatever it might be. Um, and we're quite good at having labels on normalizers. Um, they are sometimes a bit different depending on what the source was. But I, uh, I think it was last week, I did some um, Azure log analytics um, normalization, which I didn't even realize what you could get out of log analytics. And uh, we all have those labels in there already for like Azure firewall logs and so on. So um, I had to tweak our firewall dashboard slightly to um, get those into our standard firewall dashboard. Uh, but because we at least have that example, it took like five minutes to adjust. Um, so yeah, labels are useful. Um, uh, and then obviously, yes, I mean, you, you probably know that you can kind of, you know, you can generalize from that and remove certain things. Um, and uh, that, that's where I often use uh, interesting fields um, because it's just much quicker than having to write the query for, for the aggregation for every single field. Uh, instead, you get the list of the top 10 or whatever it is in those um, results. And you can see that 100% of them have an action um, and you know, very you know, only 12% have a server field. So by clicking on those, you get that pop up, and you immediately see what the different um, items are. Um, that's often quicker than running a search. Um, if a field isn't present, you can add them to it, and then rerun the search, and then you get the breakdown for it. Or as I said, you can click that little down arrow and add it in. Um, so um, again, that helps to kind of get a breakdown of what's in the content of those logs. Um, there is an option up here uh, on the interesting fields to change what it actually brings back depending on what it is that you want. Uh, so you can either have that percentage view uh, where you can see 100% of fields have that value or you can have this distinct count which is sometimes more useful and you can see there are 64 different values for EventDS or four different values for Workstation. So um, that's all things you can do without really running a query. Um, same with the charting. Uh, I almost always use a chart count by to start with, um, and um, that's kind of the way to explore the data. Um, so yeah, chart count by norm ID is always a, a nice one to see what you get. Um, also chart count by label, uh, so you can see what the different labels are that you might be getting back in your um, search result. Okay, so um, I assume that wasn't great surprises to anyone. Um, It'll get a bit better uh, in terms of interesting stuff, but um, yeah, we'll see. Um, so field manipulation. Um, what I mean by that is you get fields back and they might not be in the form that you need. So I'm not talking about normalization necessarily or keys, uh, but actually the value of the data that comes back. Um, so you could sometimes manipulate, manipulate your normalizer to normalize the field differently. Um, so we sometimes see that where there is like quotes around a field um, and you need to get rid of that or something like that. That might be a problem for the normalizer, but it could also sometimes be things that you get back like a, a path and you just want the file name. 
Um, you don't necessarily have to do that through the normalization. You can do that at runtime through various different commands in the search language. Um, and that's also useful when that's something that might be just a one-off. You want to keep the field in Lockpoint the way it's supposed to be, uh, but you uh, want to this one search to break it down differently. Um, and there are essentially two useful areas. Uh, one is norm on and regex against specific fields. Uh, and the other one is the eval process command. Um, and if you take nothing else away from this session today, have a look at the eval command. Um, there, it's, it's so good it has its own manual um, in the docs portal. Um, I think it's called evaluation process plugin in there. It's linked from various places as well. Um, and if you ever run into something that you need to do in lock point and you don't know how, have a look there. You can see um, just the string functions that that brings. Um, the, like length and substrings and cutting things from the beginning into the end and trimming and replacing. Um, and that's just the uh, string commands. There's lots of mathematical functions, statistical functions and all sorts in there. It's not entirely straightforward to use, but the documentation has good examples. Um, and I think we'll have some in here as well. Um, but yes, so this is me uh, bigging up the eval process command. So if we look at norm on and if we look at the um, example, um, in this case, we have a, and I hope you can see that, um, we have a, a log in there um, that essentially is um, invalid user um, uh, in the raw log. And then afterwards, it has the um, uh, username. Uh, in this case, it's a message that for whatever reason, we haven't normalized. Uh, so as I said, you might find the right normalizer to apply that strips that out, um, but maybe it's a message that um, you know, is very uh, not normally useful, but in this case, you want to strip it out somehow. And that's something that you can do on at runtime, uh, not only during normalization. Um, so you can see that that's what we've done here. So firstly, we're obviously um, looking um, for, any, <laughs> in this demo example, I'm excluding everything that um, has been normalized, so I'm left with those messages. And then I'm literally doing, bad example, I know, but um, a, a search for this invalid user um, field. Uh, and this is how the um, norm command is uh, used here. Um, that essentially is just literally search, searches for that string and everything that comes afterwards is a user of the type word. And I now have that in a user field. That's why it's here in red, because that was created at runtime, isn't part of the index. Uh, and then I chart counted by user, and I can do you know, the usual things that you can do once you have something in a field. Um, so that's a nice, relatively easy to use thing um, that is useful when you uh, want to manually process your messages. And as you can imagine, this could equally be a log message that has been normalized, in which case you um, use norm on that field specifically and chop up the field more. Um, so it's a really good point to bring up. Um, there has recently been the release of the universal normalizer. Um, and if you um, aren't familiar with it, and I'm not too familiar with it yet either, um, it's um, essentially your opportunity to create your own compiled normalizer. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is because a performance uh, and B, uh, you might want to give it your own interpretation of fields and so on. Um, so yes, you could do that. Um, obviously, if you use the universal normalizer or any other, it gets normalized at time of ingestion uh, and then baked into the index. Um, this is a useful tool to use if you didn't have it in place yet, um, or as I say, it might be an ad hoc thing that you don't want to do forever. Um, and uh, watch this space on the universal normalizer. I'm sure we'll be um, you know, diving a bit more deeply. I do, at least, at least at this stage, slightly get the impression that it's more of a tool to help our support guys to turn around your requests more quickly. By all means, have a look at it. If you can work it out, that's fine. There will probably be a bit more documentation on it too. Um, but there's also a lot of manual work involved in making that happen. And that's precisely what our um, KB team is normally there for. If you raise a request, I need a new normalizer build, they usually go away uh, and do it for you. But compiled normalizers have to involve engineering and they have to kind of build them. Um, so that's why they then uh, took longer to turn around. The universal normalizer is a way for them to do it just within the product and give you something and it should work. But um, yeah, 
interesting, interesting point. Um, yes, so that's the norm command. Um, it's using, if you're familiar with it, it's using the simplified log point syntax, um, where it, it kind of this, this um, word um, uh, definer, we call them, um, to kind of search for that, rather than an actual regular expression to define what that might look like. We just say it's a word, and that uses behind the scenes the regular expression that would tell us it's a word. Um, that's where the rex command comes in. If you really want to run a regular expression against um, a field, um, then you can do that too. So in this case, it's a postfix log. Um, again, not normalized, but it has postfix in it. Um, and we're essentially taking the string that's in that log um, and uh, taking a part out of it everything after that form, uh, that from. Um, and the way it does it, it's using this uh, P, I um, don't even know what they're called, um, placeholder in the, in the regular expression, um, which is um, a, a function of standard um, regular expressions to essentially assign um, a value to what they call a group. And it's that group that Lockpoint then uses as the, uh, as the field. Um, I haven't seen that many uses for specifically regular expressions, but it's there if you want it. Um, and um, it's obviously a bit more complex and powerful than just the norm uh, command in Lockpoint that uses the Lockpoint definers. The last one I wanted to share, and again, it's quite small on this, but this is something that I did for real uh, as an example. Uh, so for whatever reason, Microsoft Intune gave us um, device names that have these funky characters in. Uh, I think they are somehow lost in Unicode translation because they do Unicode, we do Unicode, but for whatever reason in between, there was no Unicode. Uh, and those placeholders are exactly that. It's kind of some kind of um, Unicode abomination. Um, so that obviously didn't look very good uh, on a dashboard. And that is one of those examples that's already in the um, logs. Uh, you probably don't want to go through the hassle of creating your own compiled Microsoft Intune normalizer. So what could you do to make those fields look nicer? Um, and that's just one example, obviously. Um, so that's where you can use the eval process command. Uh, and in fact, the uh, replace function of the eval, eval process command. Uh, this is a screenshot from the docs portal. Um, so with whatever criticism might, one might leverage at Lockpoint documentation, the search query language uh, description on the docs portal is really good and useful. And that's how these things are explained in there, usually with a screenshot, um, with the syntax, uh, even an example of how you might use it. Uh, so hopefully those kind of things will get you there. Um, so if you have weird characters in a string, you might quite like to do a string replacement. And that's what that does. Uh, because it's a process command, it's essentially like a subroutine of the eval process command. It is a bit more complex to use, but it's not that um, difficult. So in this case, it's a process eval, and then um, it's uh, adding a new field, in this case, this identifier, uh, and with the replace command of this, this, and this, which in this case you can see, you can see it in the docs portal. Um, so it's the, uh, the, the input string, uh, and then the regular expression of what to replace, and then what to replace it with. Uh, now in the docs portal, that's a nice use case as well. They're essentially obfuscating the result this way. So essentially they're finding um, something, and then every character in there, they're replacing with an X. Uh, so in the end, when you see it, it's actually like that. Now obviously, that wouldn't really help within Lockpoint, but if you want to somehow take screenshots or export it or something like that, that might be another useful thing to do. Um, so in our case, um, we did the same thing. So you can see the um, process eval command here. So um, I had to be a bit crafty. Uh, so there was already a device field um, that was a lowercase device. Um, and I replaced a, the, or created an uppercase device uh, that was assigned this uh, replace command output to. Um, so I'm taking the input, the device field, uh, I'm specifically searching for these ugly characters and then I'm replacing that with a nice escaped escape. <laughs> um, and then in the end, you get a nice looking um, kind of output string. Um, 
There are actually, as far as I know, there's an improvement coming in 7.2 where it deals with some more special characters. Um, so if anyone had problems with that, watch this space as well. Um, this is one of those examples where certain apostrophes obviously somehow get in the way as well. Um, but yeah, so that's another use of this evil string replacement command. And I've had other use cases where um, you want to cut off the leading three characters or you just want last whatever and so on. And the evil command can do all of that. Okay, yeah. Um, can you make these substitutions in the normalization phase? So yes. That, uh, yeah. um, you can theoretically. So firstly, in normalizers, you can use regular expressions. Um, and I think I've seen it done once or twice. I don't envy the person that needs to create a regular expression to do a string replacement, but I think it can be done. And then obviously in a compiled normalizer, you can essentially do whatever you need to do. Um, if it gets to that stage, it would be our uh, KB team building that um, because you can't build your own completely from scratch compiled normalizers, even with a universal normalizer. Um, but it can be done um, in various ways. So it kind of depends on the use case um, and you can always request it from us if it's a, a field that's you know incorrectly normalized, for example. Um, but um, I guess that would be when you need to involve our team because you want to do it at a larger scale with a normalizer. Uh, obviously, you can use the, uh, these kind of commands after the fact if it's just a one-off. Okay. Um, then the next thing is something that I came across, and I think some of you might know this, um, that uh, is still useful. Uh, it's also worth talking about a little bit because um, there's a lot of different reasons why people want data out of Lockpoint. Um, and there's multiple ways of doing it. Um, for example, there's the export function. Uh, that's quite um, complex to set up because you need to have your SFTP um, that you kind of, uh, or SCP, I think it is, uh, that you can kind of write your data to and so on. So if you just have an ad hoc search of like, I don't know, 30 search results and you just want the raw logs out, um, that is, um, you know, it doesn't have to be as complex as that. Um, so firstly, and again, not everyone knows this, by, um, and I can, sh it's probably easiest if I just show it. Um, so if you run a search, uh, you'll see the options up here um, that give you more um, kind of activities. And if you run a search without an aggregation, you just get this export logs fun function. Uh, if you run that, you create this export job that uh, uses export management at lock point and uh, creates an SAP copy of it and so on. That's fine if that's what you want to do. Uh, but as soon as you have um, an aggregation, and the simple one to use is the fields command, um, if you have a result like that, uh, you'll see that there are two different options appearing in here. So there's export as CSV and export as Excel um, straight from in here. Um, so it is kind of context sensitive up here, uh, depending on what you run. Um, so that's worth being aware of. Uh, and by doing that, um, you can obviously, um, you know, get individual fields. So in this case, I've um, just created a list of all the user values. Now what I should probably do to have a nice um, query is to make sure that there is a user field so I don't have all these null values. Now, use case wise, let's not discuss whether that's useful or not, but there's obviously 172 pages. You could now export that into a CSV or Excel and download it straight from the GUI uh, without having to go through exports and so on. But the next thing that normally happens is uh, you look at the um, normalized logs and the raw logs and there's all these fields in here. Uh, and you might want to export all of them, especially if you kind of do it for audit purposes or something like that. You want the entire raw logs to be exported. Um, if you wanted to do the method we've just used it, you'd have to do fields, um, log ts, comma, user, comma, device, IP, and you'd be there for a while to kind of create a list of all of those. Um, that's obviously fine if that's what you want, and maybe you want three fields and so on, but there is a special field that I don't think is particularly well documented, which is called MSG. Uh, and that is a field that Lockpoint holds that contains the raw message. Uh, so by doing an aggregation on that, essentially all you get is the entire raw message. 
Why is that useful? Because you can now export that from up here as well, uh, and it gives you the entire raw log as an export. So that's just a little um, useful little tip. Uh, and in fact, you can also now process this further. So you could now you know, do a process command on there and just extract one field. Um, or sorry, not a process necessarily, probably a norm on or so, a norm. Um, so you could extract one field out of this entire raw log and maybe call it whatever you want to call it and you know, almost ignore for this one search the normalization entirely. Um, so yes, this message field is one that's quite useful to know. Um, containing the raw log. Okay. Time in Lockpoint. Uh, and if you've been on the user training, we actually do have a little exercise in there. Um, if you remember where we do use our commands and is it smaller and larger than a certain time and so on. Um, that's one example of using time in Lockpoint searches. Um, there are a few process commands that are useful to know. Um, and they are documented in the docs portal, but uh, time is often a, um, for various reasons, in various ways, um, a hassle, um, whether it's time zones or um, comparisons of time and so on. So I thought it was useful to have in here. Um, so for example, you can assign the current time to a uh, field. And this is the command to do it. Uh, so process current underscore time, um, as now, uh, um, and that assigns that you can see it here in red. This is a field that wasn't there originally. That's the current timestamp in a field that's now ad added to the log message uh, dynamically. Um, on its own, not terribly useful, um, but in steps the eval process command again. It has a whole section on um, time functions. Uh, and in fact, that is a second way in which you can add the current time to a log. Uh, so you can use the eval process command and assign the um, now output to a field. In this case, I think I, I, I went ahead a bit, so I called it now underscore ts, but actually in the screenshot, it is just the now field. You can see it down here as well. Um, in red again, just the timestamp. Um, so that's the eval process command, adding the current time. Um, and I've kind of given it away. That's another thing that's useful to know. Um, in the previous output, this one is a better one to use uh, because we've kind of called it now. You can see that the output is actually a Unix epoch. That's what Lockpoint uses internally, and that's the actual field value. Um, but you might want to display that in an actual human readable time. And the way to do that is to not name your field now, but to um, end it with underscore ts. So anything that under is ending in underscore ts, Lockpoint interprets as a timestamp, which is why you have fields like log underscore ts. Um, that's how internally it kind of stores it as an epoch, but it knows to show that as a timestamp. It's quite fun. Try renaming certain fields to underscore ts and see what happens. Lockpoint will try to kind of turn it into a, a timestamp. Um, so that's what we're doing here by using now ts now. Um, you'll see it kind of formatted in human readable form. Um, and I'm 99% certain that that will be localized in the um, analyst user accounts time zone as well. Um, so if your time zone is set to something else, that will kind of do that conversion for you at the time. Um, the reason why I got onto this is um, there was a, a question in a support ticket. How do I check whether a log was from today? Um, and that was the answer. Um, and I thought I'd share that so people are aware. It's quite clever how it does it. Um, obviously, at some point, we might do it differently. Um, but essentially, by um, knowing that these timestamps are formatted um, internally uh, as kind of integers, um, you can kind of do string conversions in them uh, from them by using the eval process command and a string uh, conversion uh, from that timestamp. So that's a function that's available. Um, you can convert timestamps into strings. Uh, and then in this case, it just looks at um, the day element uh, from that string. Um, and then um, kind of the day element from the current time and just compares whether they're the same. 
Now, if you search for more than 30 days, you might get a problem because um, it would have the same day number again. Uh, but I thought that was quite a nifty uh, way of doing that um, by comparing the current timestamp and just the day uh, with the log timestamp and the day that is in there. Um, and then this was um, a another one that was kind of a bit of a head scratcher. Um, that was a support that was raised. Um, I wanted to get out the um, month uh, as a number, uh, and I ran this query here, um, but it actually um, gets the month as text. Um, and the function they used um, is essentially um, month of the timestamp, uh, but they're essentially there to filter this on the search. Uh, they're not there to kind of do a conversion of it. Um, so um, that's why you can't aggregate on them, and that's why if you can't aggregate, it's just a string. It can't be sorted by a number either. Um, so the actual um, answer is again the eval process command, um, and by getting the um, uh, string again, you can do a norm on command, which we've just talked about, um, against the string value of the date, um, and it literally um, you can go in and strip the individual constituent parts of a date out uh, and assign them to different um, fields. Uh, and then uh, by doing that, uh, you can kind of then sort on them uh, and chart on them. Um, now, I'm sure we'll make these available because I don't expect you to immediately kind of take these away, but it might be useful as a reference in the later, at a later stage. Um, okay, so yeah, on a general term, remember that um, Timestamps are internal Unix epochs, and that the process command, uh, the eval process command, is available to um, convert into strings and from strings uh, when it comes to timestamps. Okay, quick breather. Any questions or comments so far? Everyone's super excited. That's nice. Yeah. Say again, sorry. Yep. No. Yeah. So that is a that is an actual eval um, uh, process command, uh, and that's built into the eval process command. So it's not. It looks a bit like in um, a lookup or a table or something like that, but it's not. It's just the um, kind of Linux command. Um, and in that sense, it's worth pointing out that all of our processes are plugins. And if you really dig in, they are often pretty much that, There's like a script that runs uh, with the fields that get passed to it. So that's why the eval process command can do so much. Um, but yeah. So um, I also wanted to kind of share these two things um, because they're more use case driven. And um, I think we're all collectively trying to get better at giving actual use cases and then how you solve them rather than just going through the queries like I've just done. Um, so these two I'm going to be building up essentially based on the use case and you know, how did we get to the end result. Um, so the first one was relatively straightforward, but actually shows quite a lot of useful techniques to use. Um, we had a, I think it was a partner uh, that wanted to know when an account was locked out in Windows, what the reason was for that, and wanted that on a dashboard or in a report or something like that. Uh, and there's obviously multiple reasons to have a locked out account in Windows. Um, and in fact, sometimes that is just the reason the account is already locked, uh, and in other cases, it's uh, the reason why I have just locked your account. Um, so this is the search that you can run um, to uh, find all the locked accounts. So I can do that live. Um, label account, and we've talked about those labels. If you don't know whether you have them, a chart count by label might get you there. Uh, that should tell you which, you know, the different labels there are. And there are, depending on how long you search for and so on, there are often not that many different ones. Um, but that's where you might pick up, okay, so there is a label account. Um, so in this case, we're searching for label equals account, label equals log, 
able equals management. So that is now all the logs where a Windows user account was locked. Um, and the message helpfully is uh, a user account was locked out. Um, that doesn't give you the reason, and, and that's the challenge with this use case. Uh, there isn't a single message that tells you my user account was locked out. So how do we then find out what the actual reason was? Um, and essentially what we need to do is find all the previous login failures for that user. So in, in general, um, label equals login, label <coughs> equals fail, label equals user. That is now the reasons why a um, user wasn't able to log in. Uh, so in this case for administrator, action failed, reason, unknown username or password. Um, and now it's about um, kind of combining the two. Um, but the other challenge with these is there are actually uh, reason codes that Windows has that actually tell you because unknown username or pa password is actually something quite specifically different than all of these individual substatus codes that might tell you. Um, you know, I assume you'll never see something like that. User log on outside authorized hours. I couldn't, even, I didn't even know Windows could do that. Um, but it might be useful, you know, if you've misconfigured something to see that. So how do you um, find out why someone has been locked out? Um, well, you need to combine the previous login failure with the fact that the lockout just happened, and then you need to look up the status code to work out what the, re the actual reason was for the last failed um, login. Um, and that's where enrichment comes in. Uh, so enrichment can be useful for a lot of things, um, whether that's bringing in external data um, or threat intelligence or something like that, but you can also quite easily use it to enrich additional information like in this case. So rather than being presented with a substatus code, in the logs you will then have the actual uh, lockout reason. Um, and if we look how you do that, um, you can create a CSV enrichment source uh, and we'll call it a substatus lookup. Oops. Um, and I'll upload a file. It's uh, this one. So this is essentially a file that has um, just two um, columns. Uh, one's the substatus code that comes back from Windows and one is the clear text um, failure reason. And I didn't type all of these. These are available on the internet to copy and paste. Um, there will, I'm sure, be lots of other use cases where you could do something like that. Um, so I'm just going to upload that um, that file, uh, if I can find it. Um, and what's also nice is if you do have a header in there, um, it will, and you have that ticked, it will take that um, field name um, and use that the, the uh, header column from the, sorry, header row from the CSV as a, as a field name. Uh, so by doing that, you now have a um, table uh, called substatus lookup. Uh, and that's what we're later going to use for enrichment. Uh, now, it will sometimes take a while um, to do this, so it's always worth doing the little refresh down here, and then you get that last updated timestamp. Once that's there, Lockpoint has processed that table, and if you do a search against it, you now have a nice table in Lockpoint that has just the failure reason and the substatus code. Um, we've done all of that. And so if we now use this um, and we combine that, uh, this is the other thing uh, that um, I, I hope most of you know, but stream searches are essentially combining two searches. Uh, so one search we'll do is what we had before, which is login, uh, uh, label equals fail, label equals user. And we call that the first stream. Uh, and then we do a followed by. Um, so that is the um, last failed login followed by um, label equals account, label equals log. That's all we need for that. S stream two. Uh, and then we combine that on as one user, as two user. Uh, so 
it looks scary for people that don't know it, but it's actually fairly straightforward. So we have one search that finds all the failed logins. That's the first stream. And then we have another search that we expect to find something afterwards, which is the account log. Um, and then there will be the same user field in both, or we're going to find the ones that are the same user field in both. Um, and I'll expand the time frame a bit, hoping that we'll find something. I haven't tried that this morning. Usually there is something in here. But that is, uh, that's probably the most important part of that search. And there we go. Now there's a lot that I could say about um, stream searches. Um, uh, and, and we won't go into that too much this time. It's in the docs portal and we do cover it in the user training. Um, but yeah, so we do have some matches, uh, not as many as, as this number lets on because that's the individual matches. That's not necessarily the pairs. Uh, but so we have um, a failed login at 57, followed by an account log on this account user, Christopher. Um, and if we look at the uh, substatus code, and I had to search for that because it's always difficult to spot. You get the, in this case, it was an uh, OXC006A. Um, so that's obviously now the next thing that we need to do. Um, we need to do this um, process command to enrich that. Um, so we're not going to just do label account label equals log, but we're also in that stream then going to do a process command of lookup um, in the table substatus lookup. Um, and we're going to give it the substatus code as the field, so as the column to look up, and then it will add whatever else it finds in that row. Um, so let's try whether that an hour might be a bit quicker. And if that's all worked. That should be in here somewhere. That's the reason. What was my field name? Failure reason, okay. There we go. Um, so this is a bit more specific. So this is the 0x6 um, uh, number. So user logon with account blocked. Um, probably doesn't make an, an awful lot of sense in this case, but it might be that they have kind of already locked and relocked or something like that. Um, but, um, oh no, this one is two, three, four was the status code in this case. Um, but it's more about the concept. Uh, and we did this for a customer for real and it did work. So um, they now know the previous login failure reason um, and then know that's why this account is now locked, which is not something that Windows can tell you directly. Um, okay, did I miss anything? No, oh yes, no, I did miss something because that is then the um, nice dashboard that you can build with it. Um, now in this case, there's a few nulls in here, um, but um, this the demo data has always this strange reason because it repeats. Uh, but obviously that's something you can do once you have those fields, you can create it and, uh, in a nice little dashboard to use. Um, yeah, so that combined a few things. It combined enrichment from a source to do the status lookup. Um, and it also combined the stream searches where you can have a followed by statement for two streams where one event is supposed to follow the other. Um, so that's why that use case was, I think, quite useful. Uh, and then the second one is, um, it sounds simple, um, but it actually isn't that simple. And I was uh, reliably informed by my colleague who's sneaking out at the back at the moment, but that's actually a problem for a lot of um, seams. Um, so I want to find all accounts that have been enabled but not used in 30 days. Uh, and the reason why it's tricky is because it's always difficult to do a not, uh, because if it's not happened, there's no log message to tell you it's not happened. Um, so there's sometimes a bit of inverse logic going on. So this one is one that I, um, I blatantly stole from our uh, support team in Nepal. Um, where, that I'm amazed at what they can sometimes come up with in terms of search queries. So by all means, if you have something um, really complex that you can't get your head around and you've tried, um, they often can help with that. Uh, now, obviously, they won't build your entire log point implementation for you, but uh, especially when it comes to specific search queries, I think they, just like I am, sometimes treating it a bit like a puzzle and you're kind of trying to get there. Um, so 
how do I find all the accounts that have been enabled but not used in 30 days? Um, and I think I'm going to do it live again as well, um, if we do it like that. Um, so the first thing we need to do is to find all the users that have been enabled. So the use case for this is obviously someone's creating a user account that then never gets used. Um, there's no reason to have it. Have it. Uh, you might even combine that with a saw playbook that then removes that user account. Um, uh, so that's the general idea behind it. Um, so this is all the users that have been enabled. Um, and you can run that for the last 30 days. Um, so the demo data isn't the best, so it might repeat. Uh, but essentially, um, you know, for the last 30 days, uh, these are all the user accounts that have been enabled. Okay, so that's the first step. Um, so one thing that we can then do with this, and I've pre-populated it, but um, the logic is uh, sound. Um, and I'll talk about the middle bit in a second. Um, so there is a process to table command that you can use. I'm going to create a new table, and I have already done that in the background, called enabled users. And I'm going to put two things on that table. Uh, one, the timestamp, um, and second, the target user. Um, uh, for this. So essentially what that does is it finds all the user accounts that have been enabled in the last 30 days and it adds them to a table called enabled users uh, with the timestamp that happened at and the username that was created at the time. Um, the reason why I'm doing it to a table, and that's the nice little technique that I've used a lot, um, is because otherwise you can sometimes end up with either queries that are you know, that long and you can't understand them anymore um, or it gets so complex trying to do everything in one query that um, it doesn't really work. Um, so remember that there are lists and tables and log points that you can populate from a search, and that's sometimes a nice search, uh, nice shortcut. And you can even do that from an alert rule, so that every Monday morning it might be running that query and puts it in a table. Can also help with performance because you're then not constantly running that query every time you know there's a dashboard that refreshes it, for example. So if there's kind of like static content that you can put in a table. Uh, you can give it a certain time before it expires, so it might expire after a day and then repopulate it. Um, so we're kind of doing something similar here. Um, so this now means we have a table called enabled users that that information is on. Um, as I said, I cheated a little and have pre-populated this, this, but you can obviously um, check that by uh, running the table command on ena enabled users. Is that the one? Yeah. Um, so this is how, how the table would look. Yeah. But these aren't actually the enabled users. These are the users that have been captured. Uh, yes. Can, yes. Can't, can't you do a LDAP query? And a query? Uh, very good point. Um, yes, we could. Um, and obviously this only works if that does capture all the users yeah. that are enabled. Um, and in that sense, there are often different ways of skinning the same cat. Um, so uh, we can obviously kind of get the fields from LDAP and, and get the uh, look through the LDAP table. Um, but um, in a way, this would also work for other sources. Um, so if it's, I don't know, G Suite users um, or your Unix local accounts or something like that, you might still be able to apply the same logic. Um, so we now have that table of the enabled users. Uh, and then the second thing we'll do is we want to know whether these users um, were actually used for anything. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we essentially search through all our logs and we count for each user how much activity they had. Uh, and um, I should probably limit that to the Windows repo just in case. Our demo data um, didn't start that long ago. Um, but that might sound like super complex, but if you do it as a um, key value search, um, even over 30 days, and I've tried it in a few places, um, it's not too bad um, because it's key value search, it's just one field that gets aggregated. So essentially, we now have a count of all the activity that we saw for each of the user accounts in Lockpoint um, and how many events we had. And so that's essentially all the users that did have activity. Uh, and this is a trick that I now saw used that I didn't know we could do. 
Um, so we do another stream search. So on one hand, we have the table of enabled users. That is the first stream search. So that blew my mind a little, so you can essentially run a table search as a stream and no other parameters. That's essentially everything on that table. Um, and then we do a left join. So we definitely want the ones on the left, but we're now also adding something on the right. And that is essentially just an aggregation. So both of these things are slightly unorthodox that I wouldn't necessarily know to start with. Um, so you can just run an aggregation in your stream as well. Um, again, without a, a search, really. I mean, we can obviously do that, but um, in this case, we just do it that way, so it's a bit more interesting. Um, and then we use the target user field. That's what we stripped out into the enabled um, user table and compare that with what we get back from the second search, which is every user's activity. That'll take a while. Um, and this might take a bit longer in real environments. Um, our demo is quite light. Uh, but this is now the results. So essentially, we had three users that were created, enabled. Uh, that was Jack, Linda, and Adrian. <laughs> and his head goes up. Um, and two of those had activity. So we find stuff in the second search. But the third one doesn't actually show any activity in this 30-day time period. Um, and that's why that's only one match. So we could almost leave it at that, we can, but we can kind of make it even prettier. Um, and we can now search on that output and search for everything where the second stream doesn't exist, essentially. So that's minus S2 user. Um, so that finds everything where, um, sorry, I had a refresh problem. Need to wait for that again. So that finds everything where there's um, a result in the first part, but none in the second stream because there is no second stream. And so we run it like that. There's only this one result left. So that is the one user. Um, and I can go even further and um, I'm going to co copy and paste that um, because I want to kind of want to type that. So this is technically um, the user that didn't have um, activity in that time, but I can also compare that with a timestamp and see whether the difference is larger than what I'm searching for um, because I could still find users in here um, that have been uh, enabled in the wrong time. Um, so by doing that, it compares the now timestamp with the event timestamp, sees whether that's larger than that time frame that I'm looking for, um, and hopefully eventually finds a result. Um, yeah, there we go. So that is still a valid result because it does have that difference of times um, that is bigger than that. Um, so yeah, so that was the other use case I wanted to show um, because that combines quite a few things. Um, firstly, again, the stream search, the fact that you can use a table in general, uh, the fact that you can use a stream search against a table to find everything that's on the table, um, and then also the aggregation as the second stream, um, that that is just a query, uh, and then also how you exclude something where the second stream doesn't exist. Um, that's why I wanted to build it up like that, um, because that um, you know, it makes sense once you unravel it, but essentially, um, and I, I color coded it in my presentation, so hopefully that'll be useful in the future. Um, I saw this as the result of the support uh, team ticket, and I kind of I had to analyze that for kind of half an hour as to what that was actually doing. So I thought that was a quite a good learning exercise. Okay, so in terms of time, we're right at the at the end. Um, I did want to direct you to the Lockpoint community as well. Um, there are people active there that know far more than I do. Um, so if you have an interesting query that you'd like to share or you have an interesting problem that you're trying to solve, um, that is potentially the way um, to go. Uh, and all of us are active in there, but lots of our uh, more competent partners than us um, often help out in there. So that's quite useful. Um, okay. 
So I, I, I don't know how, how useful this was, whether that was pitched too low or too high, or whether you took anything away from it. We'll make the slides available, I'm sure. Um, and uh, now it's time to break out your laptops and do your own searching um, with our capture the flag exercise. Um, we we'll won't necessarily start immediately, so you'll have time to set it up. Um, for those of you that do want to participate, obviously everyone that doesn't want to really do anything today, you're free to um, either just observe or um, go somewhere else. Um, thank you for your time. So for those of you that do want to participate, um, there is a URL active. Um, we provisioned 20 machines. Um, that might be enough. Otherwise, I think it'll spin them up for you, um, but they might take a bit longer. Um, but yeah, so the URL is there. That should take you to um, the Capture the Flag environment. There is one for each of you. Uh, and there is a spa passphrase that you need to enter to get in. Um, which is this one that was auto-generated. I had nothing to do with it. Um, and that should give you access to a lock point environment that you won't know the username and password for at the moment. Um, and it should also give you um, a link to our Capture the Flag portal. Um, on that Capture the Flag portal, please register. We won't be using that data for anything, but that's how we'll um, uh, you, um, update the scoreboard and so on so we know who's who. Um, I, I did ask for prizes. Uh, I was thinking of um, cars and holidays, but I was given um, lock point hoodies, of which you might already have one, but um, that's the best I can do for the first three placed participants. Um, but yes, I, I thought that might be more useful than having to type um, specific queries. So we'll just be asking you certain things, and then hopefully you can find the answers in that lock point system. Um, hopefully you won't need to register. You should be able to go to that and just type in the username, uh, sorry, not the username, the passphrase. Let me try that um, myself. Yes, for an email and passphrase. Yeah, is that email and passphrase? Yes. Okay, so in that case, it, it needs your email address as well then. Um, just, well, you could probably use a th throwaway one, I think. When will you start? Yeah, so um, the environment is up. At some point, I will be asking all of you whether you're in and you have access and you've registered on the Capture the Flag portal. And when everyone's ready, I'll unlock it and you can start. It's just I know there are a few running for their computers, so maybe yeah, make yeah. a few minutes. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, we'll just take until um, the end of the hour, so um, there's enough material in there to keep you occupied. Um, but I don't expect everyone to kind of get all the answers in the time frame. Um, so let me just double check that that's all up. Would you Not necessarily, yeah. What? Not necessarily, yeah. Not, not necessarily. Um, it depends on the kind of... Um, on the <laughs> it depends on the... Yeah. Then you do have like a, a good feeling. 
So, so it, in this case, as I said, it works. Right? Yeah, it, it, it works. But in some cases, in some cases, it doesn't. Right. 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 Can people on the stream also participate? Potentially. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but yes, it would work. Okay. So maybe you should address it. Could you address it uh, when you're. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, apparently we have viewers on the stream, which is quite interesting. So this should also work for anyone at home. Um, I'm not sure we have in, enough environments for everyone, but um, this is a publicly um, accessible URL. Um, so um, you should be able to participate and we should see you on the general scoreboard as well. And I think we will be taking 10, 15 minutes at this stage. I think some people are still catching laptops and so on. Sorry? Um, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. frantically thinking. Um, yes. If you do get that problem, um, do you have some kind of endpoint security on your machine? I know, obviously not. Yes, we have. And that's why. Um, so anyone that has problems, um, let me just find the um, IP address. Um, because it's a dynamic host name, the endpoint security blocks the um, access. Um, but you can get to the capture the flag portal with the IP address. So let me just um, look up the IP address. So, yeah, I'm having an issue here. Mm -hmm. the, um, the guy is not able to register on the port of. Okay. So he's in Cloud Share. Yeah. But on the CTF portal, yeah. he clicked on register. Yeah. With username, email, and password. Yeah. Can he put any kind of password? Or? Yeah. Okay. It doesn't have to be this. Uh, uh, no, no. Sorry. So this is just for um, the first step. Yeah. So okay, okay. this here is the access to the entire environment. Um, when you register in the Capture the Black portal, you can define your own username, email address, and password. No, you can define it there and then it's just for today and right now. Yeah. Yeah, you got forbidden error. That's the other part. I'll put it on the screen in a second. Um, So once you have logged in with the Happy Hippo, um, you should be getting this screen, um, which has a lockpoint GUI. Uh, you won't have the uh, username and password for that yet. I'll share that once we start. Um, but you should also have this um, CTF questions portal. Um, and that should look like that. If that doesn't come up for you, uh, it's because the uh, host name is a dynamic host name and endpoint solutions sometimes block that. 
Uh, so you can then go uh, to this IP address in a separate browser uh, and open it that way. Do you have to register now here? Or? On this one here, you need to register. Yeah. Uh, and if you do that here, this is all your choice. Um, doesn't need to correspond to anything. Yes. So if you do get permission denied, um, it's because your endpoint security on the computer is blocking it. Um, but that's the IP address. Yeah. Uh, I think it's just the Crown Plaza one. It's public and immediately live. when they click on the register on the CTF portal, so they have access to the form. So I guess okay, the network the connectivity pipe. is all right. Yeah. But when they click, they enter a username, password, and uh, email address, they click on register, and then they have a forbidden error. Yeah, let me just check whether there's something wrong with it. Like if it's about uh, read access or... Yeah, let me, I might have to um, troubleshoot the portal. I just need to make sure that okay. not everyone has that problem. Oh, Everest 2, I have no idea. <laughs> What's the Wi-Fi? But you, you, you just use the Crown Plaza. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's open, but uh, it, it works. <laughs> and that's the IP for the... Uh, oh, you, no, you don't have to... You, you can use this one, but if, only if you have issues. Oh, okay, I didn't uh, hear the procedure, so just to pick up my laptop. Oh, okay, okay. Um, <coughs> yes, the tiny URL. Oh yes, yeah, so the yes, sorry. This is the one. Thank you. So people can access. Yeah. I'm in here. Uh, yeah, it's strange. This IP, mm -hmm. and it says for show default page. And here, I want to try to register. This. Come on. <laughs> and you say, I try one email. I want another one. And that's it. Enter forbidden. You don't have the permission to access the press source resources. It's either read protected or not readable by the server. So if you go to that one again, yeah, this is the bit that's strange. So I think this one is because it gets redirected to this when you log in. Yeah, um, but there's definitely no plex running on our server. So I don't know where that's coming from. Is that the right IP? Yeah, pretty sure it was. 104? I thought it was 104. Yeah, I'll try again. Yeah.
address. And that's yes. your endpoint getting in the way and you need to use the IP address. Oh, okay. okay. This one. <laughs> exactly. Um, Yeah, it's because it's an embedded iframe. Um, I think it doesn't like it because it's a dynamic um, host name. Um, So that's not entirely right. So I think we'll give it another five minutes or so until everyone's ready and then we can kick off. Is everyone logged in that wants to participate? That will be like that, unfortunately. I'm getting the bats. Yes, in the cloud share you will get that, but if you open so a new browser, right here, yeah? yes. Okay. So you're in the right place there, and okay. ignore, ignore the cloud cloud share if that doesn't work. Uh, um, will I see the questions here? Yes. Well? Okay. This is like. This yeah. is the holding. The holding. Yes. Yeah. So this one. Yes. Yeah, so if that works, yeah, that one won't work. The, the yeah, iPhone, but this one will. This will work once it's ready. Okay. So I think in the room we are ready. Anyone else with problems? Are we all ready to go? No, we're not quite ready to go. So you need to open this uh, IP in the browser. So. Oh, okay. Okay. And you can register there. Oh, okay. The game will be on the IP instead. Oh, okay. Okay. I thought it was on Okay. Yeah. yeah. I didn't register an actual domain name. That was the problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I can. already registered. Okay. If you remember, then you can log in like that. Yeah, I didn't remember, but. 
Okay, so I think we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people registered in the Capture the Flag portal. So that's good. That's ten people that are ready to go. No, that's right. Um, okay. All right, everyone ready? Thumbs up? Okay, um, so I'm going to unlock the challenge. Which I hope is now active. If you refresh your Capture the Flag page, does that now have challenges? Missed a bit. Now you should have challenges. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, so the only other thing is you need a log point to log into. Yeah. This is the username and password for your log point. So it's LPCTF, the username, and then this think in CTF exclamation mark with those capitals is your password, and then you're in your log point. Okay. One thing I'd like to add is the challenges are not necessarily in order, um, and the advanced challenges aren't necessarily that much more advanced either. Um, so if you can't work something out, feel free to just move on to a different question. There are some that are dependent. They are kind of bonus questions that only get popped up when you get the original answer right. Um, so there shouldn't be too much in there where it's kind of building up on each other. Some questions have hints, uh, not all of them do, uh, and most of the hints take points from you. Um, the very first hint doesn't require points because you don't have any points at that point. Um, but yeah. Sorry? Is this a new lab passphrase? Oh, sorry. Because it's not. <laughs> that is an old one. <laughs> Apologies. <Okay. laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. It's Takumi, the smiling hippo, not the walrus. Sorry, I confused everyone. There we go. Did generate that automatically. Yeah. <laughs> I like this. It was it was a new one. Sorry. I've prepared it before, obviously, and then 
updated one slide and not the other. The good news is that no one has scored any points so far, so you can, uh, any point will do.
Ah, we've got points. I didn't realize I had to manually refresh the page, so. <laughs> um. So I'm glad to see that there are some points on the board. Um, so there are some points to be had. Um, if something doesn't make sense or it's too difficult, then just move on to another one. But um, it's also three scores, which means I can get rid of all my hoodies. So it's a good start. We have a new entry on the scoreboard.
Okay. I think at least half of our participants have scored. So I think that's actually not a bad rate. Um, I'd say we go for another 10 minutes until um, five minutes before the hour. Um, and then I close the competition. Um, and then we have five minutes to discuss the results. Um, but uh, yeah, so you have 10 minutes left.
So for anyone that had problems with question six, there was a, uh, a rogue quotation in my answer. Um, so if you had the answer for question six and you might want to try again, I fixed it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that one. All right, it is now 3.55 and as I said, we're going to uh, end the competition now. So if anyone wants to get some last desperate points in, you have a few seconds while I try to figure out how I actually turn you off. Um, yep. Um, it should be straightforward. There's two quotes in it. So it's the executable and then space, two quotes around the QV list. Um, all right. So how do I turn you off? Okay, so I think that's it. Um, it's now paused. Um, I think you can potentially still enter stuff, but um, the scores won't count. Um, so I think that was it. Um, I'm glad to see that quite a lot of people got at least some points. I apologize for 
technical issues, issues with quotes and spaces and answers, um, difficulty levels and so on. Um, I hope it was still a bit of fun and uh, hopefully better than just a lab exercise where we tell you to run certain queries. If you did like it, please uh, let people know in Lockpoint that it was awesome and you want it again next year. Um, and then we can maybe do it a bit more professionally. Um, but um, thank you all for attending. Uh, we don't have any great awards ceremony or anything like that. I was just given a big pile of um, hoodies. Um, and if people could identify themselves under cover of darkness, of course, um, I can hand out hoodies. Um, who is SIPA? Anyone in here? It might be online. Um, right, second place, Tola. That is you. Congratulations. What, are, what, what about the partnership? <laughs> <laughs> you can share the hoodie. <laughs> um, third place, Fisnik95. There you go. Very good. And then last, Coyote and L. Ah, very good. Right. If the size isn't right, we might be able to swap it. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, everyone. Um, and I think that is us done. I'll check online whether SIPA was online, um, in which case we'll somehow have to send them a hoodie.